bit more about the club SMU GIA where I'm from. And yeah, okay, so first. Okay, so basically, SMU GIA is actually a student club in uh, SMU. So we, our vision is to build a sustainable ecosystem for analytics in SMU. So um, we want to make sure that everyone in SMU has the opportunity to have a chance and a shot at analytics. And also, we also want to connect with industry people like yourselves, like professionals, to come down for our events. And from there, we can better engage the public and help our students understand how the real world works for analytics. So a bit more about us. At the moment, we do have 700 plus members in our Telegram. Um, we have 200 over BIA members across the schools, mainly being the undergraduates, but we do have an increasing pool of master students joining us. And we have 32 members of dedicated data associates who meet on a weekly basis to do analytics related stuff, be it like the statistical learning in R that we have just covered. And at the same time, they also cover some projects in their own teams. We, at the moment, we also have 14 industry partners that we have engaged over the last academic year. And so far for our events, we have had one networking session involving about 10 industry partners. And we have had five industry talks spread out across the year, as well as six workshops. So some of the past events that we had were like Introduction to Python, Namha and Panda's workshop, uh, the NLP, Introduction to Tableau, which we have worked with the Tableau team to come up with, and also we had Machine Learning and Neural Network, who we have worked with Terra AI to come up with. I think one of the Terra AI with us today, Christian. Christian. There, he's at the back. Yeah, so they actually came down to train our students for over the recess week for two days doing neural network related stuff. So all these workshops are actually very useful for our students, who especially those who are dabbling with the area of analytics. And they really want to find out more about how to code. And so Python was actually really a good first step that we had. So other events that we engage more professionals like you guys are actually the networking session and the industry talk. And at the at these events we have had the alumni sharing, we have had DBS and Credit Suisse come down and talk to us about how analytics work in the banking sector. We have had Expedia we go just very recently sharing about how they use analytics and how they use um, search engine marketing. We have had Bluebird sharing more about the programs and internships they were offering, as well as IMDA sharing about what they do in the government sector, what the projects, what the opportunities, and what were the, uh, sorry, the scholarship that they were providing. So all these are avenues in which the SMU BIA aims to engage professionals like you guys. And so far we have these partners and if you guys are interested in working with SMU BIA, you can get in touch with us. The, um, this is a bit more in depth about our, our talent pool. So we do have a large pool of data enthusiasts, the 200 members that we have. They are actively involved and interested in joining such analytics events. Um, and the DA that I've spoken about earlier, the 32 dedicated members who meet on a very regular basis to develop their skills in a co-learning setting. And because this year was actually our first structured DA that we have had in the past AY, and moving forward, they will be the senior DAs. They are the trained people with advanced Python and Tableau competency, and they will be men helping to mentor the next generation of DAs. So more about our collaborations, we do have several marketing channels in place. Um, our email blast reached out to 9,000 students in SMU. And right now, our Instagram is actually quite new, so it's, it has 100, 100 followers and it's just growing. Um, on the website, if you visit us, you can go on to SMU 
www.ncia.org to find out more about the events that we have had. And also we are de developing our medium channel where we post more about like technical competency and like how the student life is for our BIA members. So if you wish to work with us, you can take a screenshot of like this slide. So that's all our contact channels. And before I round it up, um, we are actually, SMABI is actually an IIE club, so which, is, which stands for the Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So they are actually holding an event um, on the 2nd of April, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. This is also open to the public. So if you guys would like to sign up, you can scan the QR code here, or you can contact us afterwards to sign up for this event. Mm -hmm. Um, at this event, you'll be inviting Melvin Ang, the founder and executive chairman of MM2 Asia. So, he will be sharing more about Singapore-based film production and distribution company with global footprint and most notable producing the hit movie series A Boys to Ben. Okay, so if you watch this series and you want to find out more, you can go to this AMA event where you can ask him anything. Yeah. And before I close off, we'll have Gabriel come up to tell you who's the next speaker. Thank you, Gabriel, for being a nice event. Thanks for coming out today. Thanks now, if I prop to share our fraud detection in currency.
talks going to be titled Corporate Fraud, LDA, and Econometrics. So LDA is a machine learning technique, um, the only machine learning technique I'll talk about in this uh, talk, but there's, of course, others that are relevant. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to go through these three topics. I'm going to do them in order. We need some grounding about what corporate fraud is before we can actually talk about it, right? So I think a lot of you guys are coming more from the IT side. You've heard of fraud. You kind of know what it is, but you don't know exactly what's going on, right? So if we want to actually figure out how we can detect anyone who's doing fraud, we need to know what they're doing. Um, then we'll get into the technical part, right? So our main problem is going to be this. How can we detect if a firm is currently involved in a major instance of misreporting? So when I say detect, that means we're going to have some sort of classification problem. When I say that we're going to do it currently, right, it's also a prediction problem. So we want to know today who's committing fraud, right? These aren't companies that have been found out already, right? These are the companies that are actively doing fraud. Nobody knows who they are, right? But we want to figure out who they are so that we can stop them before it gets too bad. Uh, and then this reporting is going to be uh, what we're going to talk about next, but sort of the accounting side of this, right? So we have this mixture of some analytics stuff. That's these uh, classification prediction. And then we have the accounting side or the business side, um, and we're going to fuse those two together. Um, to actually do this, right, we're going to have a bit of business insight, some economic theory, some actually psychology theory as well. Um, so actually getting into the mind of what the management's doing. Um, and then also we'll have our more uh, core techniques, right, our statistics, machine learning, our econometrics, et cetera. As for why we care about this, well, fraud costs a lot of money, right? Just in the US, just for the 10 most expensive frauds, just to the shareholders, they lost 13 billion US dollars, right? That's only to one of these parties, right? We're ignoring a lot of the costs, right? So we're ignoring, say, the cost to the country, right? The GDP impact. Just one fraud alone, this Enron, was expected to have about 35 billion US dollars in impact on the US GDP for one year, right? That's ignoring also their contribution to future years. Also, we're ignoring societal costs, right? A lot of people lose their jobs, a lot of people lose confidence in the economy, or the performance of the economy. Right? From a government perspective, those are actually quite crucial. Um, there's also some negative externalities going forward. Right? So when you have a fraud, a lot of times we'll have some regulation that comes out to try and prevent this again. That's an extra cost that every other company has to have to comply. Right? So it also drags down the economy a little bit. Um, and then, of course, right? there's actually just uh, a, raw, not, a raw total. Um, so actually, if you think about it, if we can just catch one more of these guys, right? we're saving over a billion dollars. We're catching one <coughs> Right? If we can do this en masse, right, we can save billions of dollars for the economy. That's uh, actually quite important. So what is misreporting? A uh, simple definition, so if there's just one thing you take, take away from the accounting side of this talk today, it's that misreporting is just when you have an error that affects a firm's accounting statements or their disclosures, and it was done seemingly intentionally. This word intentionally is very crucial. Uh, and it's <coughs> done intentionally by either management or some other employee at the firm. Right? So the key about fraud is that they did it on purpose. Right? So we're not talking about somewhere where a company did something wrong, it caused a lot of problems, but it was a pure accident. Right? That actually happens a lot. But it's not, it's not like they were actually doing it on purpose. Right? There's sort of, you can blame them, but you can't really blame them quite so much. Right? It also tends to not have quite as far-reaching consequences. But when you have, say, a CEO or a CFO or some other managers who are actively trying to circumvent the controls in the company, to try and make everyone think the company's fine and then it just collapses, right? That was say WorldCom, right? You take a company that's worth tens of billions of dollars and it goes just, just goes away overnight. That's a problem. Now, as far as how this is typically done, right? Your traditional accounting fraud is if you have a company that's just not doing well, they say, well, let's try and find some way to make it look like we're doing well anyway. Right? They just find some scheme, cover it up, right? So say Wells Fargo, right? From 2011 to at least 2018, they do still ongoing. Um, they were just duplicating or making fake customers, right? That's an easy way to say, look, we have more revenue, but they didn't do it then, right? They did this for millions of accounts. Uh, and then, we, of course, tell everybody that's investing in the company, look, everything's great, and they believe it. That's a fraud. But there's plenty of other ways to do it, right? So Dell, um, for a long time, they did the opposite. They were doing so well, they didn't want to tell investors just how well they were doing. And so instead, they just hid a lot of the payments they were getting from Intel, right? So in, actually, Intel's payments made up over 76% of their revenue in one quarter. But they just didn't mention this, right? And then at some point, things stopped working out. They try and cover it up with that, but eventually the money dried up, and then, well, bad things happened. So we could have options backdating, right? Apple just didn't tell people exactly what their expenses were, right? That was a lot of tech companies in the mid-2000s. Uh, you could have related party transactions, right? So there's China and North, uh, Northeast Petroleum Holdings, 
They made 176 transactions between the company and various family members, right? Just giving money, giving loans to family members without telling investors what the money was for. That's a problem. Or you could have some uh, perhaps more interesting ones, right? So CVS, sort of like uh, like your typical drugstore in Singapore, like Watson's. Uh, CVS has improper accounting for stuffed animals, right? So actually, their their accounting statements were off for over 20 million dollars just because they uh, didn't properly account for their stuffed animals. Sounds a little funny, but it's actually a serious issue, right? That means there's $20 million they say they have that they do not have. Uh, or you can have uh, some really weird ones like this country, uh, Countryland Resorts, or Wellness Resorts. Um, they're not a resort company, they're a mining company, first of all. And uh, so they have this warehouse, right? And they say, okay, in this warehouse, we have a bunch of gold. There's a tarp over it. The auditor said, yeah, it seems fine, right? There's a warehouse, there's something there, gold, good. Then at some point, the auditor decided to check what's under the tarp. It was dirt. They had no gold. As a mining company, it was a problem. Um, so in that case, right, the company completely fabricated their entire existence. Um, so we have all sorts of crazy things happen. And we're trying to figure out what all those are, right? Or who's doing any of those. Now, as far as where we're going to actually get data from this, um, the US government conveniently actually provides this data publicly. Um, and it's not so usable form, but it's there, right? So we have, uh, say, this US uh, SEC AAER, or accounting and auditing enforcement uh, releases. That's gonna be one of the main sources because essentially anytime there's a really big fraud, the US government just publicly shames that company with this type of document. They say, hey look, this company is doing these bad things. So we're just gonna say, look, this company did all these bad things and just publicly tell everybody about it and not give the company any say in how we discuss this. Uh, sometimes companies release it on their own accord. The file an amended, amended annual report, um, so something called the 10KA filing. The slash A means amended, right? They're saying, there's something wrong in the previous one, use this one instead. Uh, also, the US government has another channel called 13B Actions. Uh, there's a couple other places, notes inside annual reports, just trying to hide it, um, or press releases, right? So there's a lot of ways you can get this data. They're all subtly different, though. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about how to deal with that way. Uh, but as far as where that leaves us, right? Well, one, we know there's a lot of reasons for fraud, which is going to be kind of painful, actually, right? If we're trying to be on the analytics side, we want to say, how can we detect fraud? We have to detect all of those things I mentioned and more, right? All of these are frauds, all of these are problems, but they're all quite different. Um, also, none of them happen very frequently, right? So we can't, say, break these up into individual types of fraud, because maybe each year we have five of those, right? We can't get enough data to actually nice classify. Uh, also, as I said, there's uh, a bunch of different areas to get this data, but they're all subtly different. So we'll have to be very cognizant of that and perhaps just use a bunch of them. Right? So instead of just predicting one type of uh, measure, predict a bunch of them. Uh, and we also need to be uh, aware that I mean, we're, just, we're getting into a hard problem. Right? So we're detecting something that's quite varied, and we don't have uh, necessarily well-defined data. Right? So it's going to be a tough tough thing to approach. So let's get into the uh, more analytic side of this. So as a main question is just going to be, how can we detect if a firm is currently involved in a major instance of misreporting? Uh, the way we typically do this back in the 1990s was pretty naive. We decided, well, let's use some financial ratios. If companies are uh, misreporting, right, they're probably, uh, their financials are probably wrong. That was the whole thought, right? Um, that worked for a bit, and then it stopped working. There's a good reason for this. Man essentially, managers realize if you go above certain thresholds and certain ratios, your auditors start asking questions, right? So you just don't manipulate beyond that, and then you know you're fine. Uh, after that, the uh, accounting research said, well, why don't we look at how they write their annual report? Maybe that's helpful, right? So let's see if there is, if they're overly positive or overly negative, or maybe their report's overly long or overly short. Right? Maybe we can use that. That added a bit of prediction power, actually. Uh, but then this new model I'm going to tell you guys about today it says, well, why don't we just look at what they actually said, right? The simple idea is if they're, say, manipulating your inventory, they probably don't want to talk about inventory. It's pretty straightforward, right? But that's the whole intuition behind it, right? If they're going to be manipulating something, they're going to dance around it. Um, as far as all these, if you really like, uh, want, if you really see the details, I have this paper, Brown, Carly, and Elliot, 2018. It's publicly available. You can grab a copy of that after the talk. Um, you can see all the details there. It's like 80-some pages long, so it's quite uh, detailed. 
Okay, as far as the issues that we're going to have to address, um, so as I said, this is a hard problem. We'll have a lot of things that we have to be very careful about. But first, we have to figure out how we're going to deal with varied events, right? Uh, so there's two options here, uh, or two ways we'll do this, right? So one is careful feature selection. I put careful in quotes because I'm not going to actually do it myself, right? I'm actually going to use some econometric techniques to take care of this for me. Uh, the second is going to be intelligent feature design, right? Again, I'm not going to do all that, right? Instead, I'm going to say, well, we're going to look at the content of these documents. I'm going to have a machine learning algorithm take care of that, right? That'll be actually a pretty nice approach. Uh, the second part is now we're going to have a model that's awfully complicated because now we have some machine learning techniques in there. If you want to go to a business and tell them how this thing works, uh, we have a problem, right? Managers typically don't want to hear, oh, we have these sophisticated techniques, you know, here's, the, here's the model, right? The model has 50 variables. They don't want to see that, right? They just want a simple, intuitive way to see it. And they also want maybe some uh, some other results to show confidence that this measure works, right? So we'll see how we can do that. Uh, uh, the third part, right? We're going to have to deal with uh, predictive modeling, right? The predictive modeling in this case is going to be a bit difficult. Uh, as I said, we actually have very sparse data as well. And so we'll have to just, uh, be a bit uh, cognizant on the statistics and econometric side there. And we use a window designed to take care of that for back testing, and I'll show you guys how that works. Um, and then also, just the infrequent events are going to be difficult to deal with, and so we're going to have to also deal with that. So that's the roadmap for what we're going to talk about. Uh, just a little bit about how the model actually performs. So here in purple, uh, you can see the model that we proposed. Uh, and it's just a very simple measure. Just take the top 5% of uh, companies picked up by the algorithm and see how many frauds they pick up. Right? For the AERs, that's what the US government says, this is so big we want to publicly shame the company. Our model is 59% better than anything else out there. Right? So just actually adding this bit of what companies are talking about actually adds a lot of prediction ability. Right? We're, in terms of raw percentage, about 8% more uh, just of flat add 8% to the uh, overall prediction power for the algorithms. Uh, in terms of some other things like the 13Bs, which are a little bit more varied, we actually even have a higher gap between our measure and the other ones. Uh, and we can pick up other stuff too. Uh, the other one I want to mention though is right here. This ADR first year column means the very first year a fraud started, that's how many we can pick up. Right? So the very first year, we're going to get about 15% of all frauds. That doesn't sound very great, right? But actually, frauds are really hard to detect, especially at the beginning, because they haven't started snowballing, right? The fraud sort of, over time, becomes easier to figure out, because it just starts sort of compounding. And so, actually, there's a lot of frauds, right? Between the start of the fraud and when they get caught, the average is something like six years. Right? So the fact that 15% of these we're going to catch in year one is actually really important, especially from a government perspective, right? If you, say, just plug this into your uh, reporting systems, you can detect 15% off the bat, that's, you know, well, in this case, right, that gives you an extra 5% of companies that are committing fraud that you never have to deal with down, uh, say, six years from now, right? That saves a lot of time and a lot of money. Okay, so for the varied events, um, okay. so, uh, yeah, so these are the, just the past models. Um, so just a, sim a simple uh, sort of few measures for these, right? So the, the old model said the old one was financials, right? So it's the things like how big is the company? Just log of uh, amount of assets they have. So you have percentage cash sale, or percent of change in cash sales. So how many of their sales are in cash? Um, it's a typical way to sort of manipulate this. Uh, or are they having a merger or not? A lot of times actually these mergers aren't necessarily for business purposes, but for hiding things, right? If you have a complex transaction, you need to sort of toss everything in. Uh, that's like, sort of the Olympus fraud, for instance. Olympus used mergers and acquisitions to uh, hide everything they were doing for like 15, 20 years. Uh, the whole theory behind that was just economic, right? We just say, if a company's committing fraud, it's going to end up showing up in their accounting statements. We'll try and use that. Uh, the new models, the, the new, slightly newer models using the style of their documents, right? Those included things like the length or how repetitive the document was, word choice, sentiment, grammar, sentence structure, uh, those sort of things. The theory came from communications and just said there's some sort of unintentional bias, or some yeah, unintentional biases or hidden biases that will manifest when you're trying to do something that's uh, fraudulent. Uh, and then some of them actually were quite ad hoc. They just said, well, maybe this works, and it happened to work. Right? 
right? There was no theory at all for some of those measures. Uh, actually, in terms of our paper, we actually test another 86 variables. Um, we test 17 uh, financial variables, 20 style variables in the model already. We test another 87. Uh, the model that we're going to be using, as I said, is going to look at the content of these documents. Right? So we said financials, they're too easy to actually cover up. Right? The style of the document is a little, it doesn't really capture that much. Right? It captures some summary statistics, but you're not getting at the actual you know, substance of this document. Uh, so instead, we're going to take all those variables from before, use that as a baseline. Right? But then we're going to say, we're going to quantify how much of each of the, or how much these documents talk about the different things. Right? Uh, now, one problem with these documents is that they're like 20 pages on the low end, up to 300 some pages on the high end, right? Uh, so computationally, they're quite painful to actually run. Uh, we'll end up training on five years at a time. Uh, this is in part because I didn't have uh, <laughs> didn't have enough RAM to run the whole thing back then. Um, but it also works quite well because we're going to be back testing, and so we don't want to use any sort of data that might sort of paint our back testing, right? We want to be very careful of how we design this. We're just going to use a five-year window when we design things. We'll run our uh, machine learning algorithm within those five years so that there's no influence from outside years. Uh, then we'll end up uh, using 31 topics per year. I'm not going to talk about that design decision, but it's covered in the uh, web appendix of the paper if you're curious about that. Uh, now, as far as why we're actually using this measure, right, the idea was that we want to think more like these managers. Right? If you're a manager and you're committing fraud, what would you do? Right? Let's say you're, again, if your fraud's in inventory, will you talk about inventory? My guess is no, right? If I was committing fraud and I was doing an inventory, I probably don't want to talk about inventory. I'm going to dance around, right? And so this is a measure that's going to naturally pick these guys up, right? That's the whole idea here. Now, some examples of what these look like. Uh, so these are straight from the paper, right? We have, say, one topic. It's about more aerospace things, titanium, aerospace, and such included in there. We have one banking and insurance topic. Subsidiaries mentioned here, shares, or uh, sort of general business activities, uh, sales, product, internet, grouped together there. A debt topic. Uh, just to show you guys a bit of, say, what this sort of algorithm pulls out, right? These look reasonable, right? These words sort of belong together in general. As far as how we do this, it's this LDA, top, uh, LDA method I mentioned up front, right? This is, uh, stands for latent Parisla allocation. Uh, you can pretty much find this in any programming language you use. Right? So, no matter what programming language you use, there's an implementation these days. Uh, also, you probably interact with, interact with it sometime today. Right? Google search one small component of their algorithm is that. If you go to NewYorkTimes.com, you look at articles, they suggest articles to you, they use LDA to do that. Right? You go to Twitter, they suggest you users to, to uh, go follow. They're actually using LDA on the tweets and comparing that with the tweets that you like. You actually interact with this type of algorithm all the time. Uh, if you want to implement this in Python, I highly recommend Gensim. It's very convenient and also multi-threaded nowadays. Uh, if you use R, SGM is pretty good. Uh, but unfortunately, we did not have these packages back when I uh, ran this. this. This paper has been uh, in works for a long time, since 2013. Uh, so we used actually code straight from David Blay, the, or David Blay's website, the creator of the other. Uh, but what LDA is going to do is it's just going to read all these documents. All you tell it is there's, say, look for 31 topics, or look for however many topics you think there are, and it's just going to go read everything. And then it'll report back to you and say, this is a topic, this is a topic, this is a topic. It's actually really easy to use, quite intuitive. Uh, yeah, as far as implementing this, uh, there are some difficulties, though, just in this specific context. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have these things called annual reports, as I said. It's just a big <coughs> year-end document each company puts out. For any public company anywhere in the world, you have to make one of these. It summarizes everything this company has done. It gives the investors their financial information, tells you about management, tells you about management's outlook on the company. Uh, a lot of stuff in this document. Uh, unfortunately, businesses, when they're doing these documents, don't really follow any consistent way of doing it. Right? Some companies do fixed width text files. Some companies do proper HTML documents, which are quite nice. Then some companies write it in Word and then export the Word file as an HTML file. I don't know if you guys have ever worked with Word files exported to HTML, but they're horrible, right? Absolutely horrible. Uh, and unfortunately, most of these documents are that, right? So, um, and also sometimes they have embedded hexadecimal code for images and all sorts of other things that you wouldn't expect to be there. The way to deal with that is just more regular expressions, right? Just tons of those. Um, actually, I tried using, I think the Python programmers in the room were probably asking, why didn't I use beautiful soup if it's all HTML? It 
actually crashed beautiful soup because the 300 <coughs> documents, the 300 pages from Word exported to HTML, it just couldn't handle it. There's so many listed tags, it just crashes the thing. Back when it was beautiful soup, maybe uh, PS4. <coughs> uh, yeah, if you're interested in that part, the details are in the paper. All of our regular expressions are listed out. So if you ever have to deal with this, look at our paper and don't have it. Then you don't have to go through it. Um, then you've got the other usual stuff, right? Dealing with text audio, stemming, limitization, all that sort of stuff. Then you feed it to LDA, tune your hyperparameters, and then you finally can implement the model, right? So actually most of the work is dealing with the text data up front. Um, a few other considerations, right? So LDA is going to tell us how much weight there is on a topic. It's not going to make it proportional, so further regressions will make it really proportional. Um, and then the other issue is that these are going to be heavily industry related, right? And that's not very really useful for our problem, right? If we have a cable company and they're talking a lot about cable, we don't care, right? It's a cable company. We expect that. We want to know if they're a cable company and they're talking about less cable less than you would expect a cable company to do. And so we're actually going to use this uh, regression process here to orthogonalize two industries to actually strip these components out of the topics, right? So that way we actually end up, so the measure we're going to use is not how much they talk about something, but how much they talk about something relative to what you'd expect a firm in their industry to do. Right. But it, it's, it's a relatively simple manipulation, but it makes this measure much cleaner and actually gives you a lot more uh, power when you want to go and detect fraud. Okay. Part two, interpretability. Right. So the site management doesn't know what LDA is. Right. They don't care what LDA is. They would like to know that it works in a business context, probably. Right. Unfortunately, no one actually studied that. So there's a lot of papers in CS that study various topics, right? But there's not that many corpuses of tag business contacts, uh, content, right? And so we decided to fill that gap too. Uh, so we actually did an experiment using real people, right? So we're going to use something called a word intrusion task. It's relatively straightforward. We take three words from one topic, one from another, and ask people which one doesn't belong. And so for the first sentence, our first one here, we have commodity, bank, gold, and mining. And it says, out of those four, which doesn't belong? The answer is bank, right? So commodity, gold, mining all fit all together. You could argue commodity and bank fit together. Gold and bank, is not quite as much, right? But gold and mining is very tight, right? Uh, we have, say, aircraft, pharmaceutical, drug manufacturing, or say, collateral, residential, and adjustable, all of our loan terms for mortgages. Iowa has nothing to do with that, right? Uh, so we give them these types of questions. We do 20 questions per person um, for 100 people. The nice thing about this is they're human, right? So we know if they work, if this type of test, uh, if they respond well to it, it seems to work for people. That's good. The problem is these guys are not business experts, and we're giving them words that came from probably the densest business document you could possibly get. And so there's uh, some pitfall there, right? So the way we get around that is a quasi-experimental mm -hmm. design, actually using another machine learning algorithm to fill in for the person. Uh, so we use a mixture of blood and word to the back. Uh, and we're going to use a glove trained on internet content, which is a very general source, right? That's, that's going to be more like the people we had before. We'll use word to vec trained on Wall Street Journal articles. So it's an algorithm that they'll know essentially, I'll say the, the meaning in quotes, right? It doesn't really know the meaning, but it, it has sort of the, the relationship between words as they're used by the Wall Street Journal of business types, right? Um, we'll also use word to vec as it's trained on annual reports themselves. So that's going to be the most specific algorithm we could possibly design in terms of how words are used in a 10K. And the nice thing about these algorithms is we can ask it literally the exact same question, but instead of doing it just 20 per person, we give them 10 million more questions, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you might as well do a full sample, right? It, it's uh, computation stuff that's fun these days. As far as the results go, we see actually, in general, uh, humans are better than chance at picking out which word doesn't belong. That means there's something to this, these topics, right? And the algorithms that are trained a bit better on uh, business tax do the best. This is unexpected. But that shows actually that in general, this is actually pretty decent. Uh, third part is going to be on predictive modeling. So for uh, that, it's largely going to be about back testing, right? So we can't really know who's committing fraud today. We simply just don't know, right? That's the purpose of us doing this in the first place. If we do that, we don't have a job. Um, instead, we're going to try and use historical data to figure out who's committing fraud today. So that's what back is. Uh, there are a couple problems to this. First, uh, well, what the supporting was actually changes over time, right? So actually, say the uh, options backdating was really popular in the mid 2000s, kind of dropped out of favor nowadays. You don't really see it, right? 
And so our targets can actually be changing over time. So we'll leave the algorithm class that's quite flexible. And uh, this recording is unobservable until it's observable, right? Ivy, mean, for our back testing, we have to be aware that when a company commits fraud, you don't know that year. If you might not know next year. You might not know the year after that. Right? In the case of sales, they started their fraud in 2004. It came out in 2011. Right? That's seven years. Um, so we'll have to be careful with that. Uh, for the back testing, we use a moving window approach, meaning we'll take, say, these five years here and use that to predict that for the following year. And then we'll just slide that over, right? So the next time we use years two through six to predict year seven, we'll use years two through year seven to predict year eight, and so on and so forth. Now we have data starting back in 1994, and so we'll use 1994 through 2012, which was the most recent data we had when the project started. Uh, the problem here, of course, is not that we have 14 models to deal with. Um, so it's going to make the statistics uh, quite big. <coughs> and so let's talk a little bit about how we can also test when we're having a uh, window design. Right? So there's actually not too much on this. Um, usually when people are doing statistical testing, right, we have one task, we do it, we're done, we look at, say, whatever, like, T stats or whatever we need, maybe an F stat, and we're good. The problem with a window design is you can't do that. You have 14 statistics, right? So you either have to look at the, in the 14 individually, or you have to find a way to summarize these 14. Um, so I'll show you guys, you can actually use the receiver operator curve area under the curve, or ROC, or ROC uh, curve. Right, it's quite common. There's a way you can actually aggregate all 14 into one. So I'll show you guys how to do that. And there's also a pre statistical method you can use called Fisher statistics, actually from back in 1932. Um, it works quite well as well. Uh, let me show a few other things. Right, the graph I showed you guys with this third one here, just using a reasonable cutoff. We also have NDC GAK in there. Um, but uh, I think the, the first two are the uh, sort of more sophisticated ways to do it, a more econometric way to So. For ROC, right? Um, the guys, for those of you who don't know what it is, a simple way to think of it is if you just take a random fraud and a random not fraud, what's the pr probability that the fraud gets ranked higher than the not fraud? That's it, right? Simple, actually a relatively simple measure, relatively intuitive, kind of difficult to calculate, but of course, as, uh, every package has it, right? Um, so anything about 0.7 is pretty good. Um, the problem is we have 14 of these, right? And so one way we'd say, well, let's just average it, right? If the average is good, it's fine, right? The problem is that you're pooling, the classes aren't equal across each pool, and so econometrically that's questionable, right? Instead, you can actually pool them together with your clustering. Um, it's in, it's used in Stata, um, which is a econometric software. Um, there was an implementation in R. It doesn't seem to be uh, well kept anymore, unfortunately. Um, but there should be some other implementations in R, so it's in like math. As far as comparing these up, right? So we're end up having a bunch of different models, right? We want to look at our model versus the best model that they had before our model came about, right? For that, that's not easy. Um, but there is a way to use a wall statistic. Um, so you can actually bootstrap some various sense, variance estimates, cluster by year, and then look at wall stats, and you can actually use that to compare statistically whether one AUC is higher than another AUC. Um, so for any of one who's actually been wondering, is it possible to actually compare these instead of saying, well, that was 0.72 and that was 0.7? The answer is yes. You can actually statistically compare them. Um, again, this is implemented in Stata as rock drag. Um, again, there was an R package for that. Again, it's still not really updated these days. Um, but you can always grab the old package, and you can actually do this in R as well. Uh, the purely statistical method is actually based on the intuition that p-values happen to be uni uh, uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. This is actually Fisher, 1932. This is a, uh, a Q&A in a journal. And he said, here, you can just aggregate the p-values this way. Um, this is how you aggregate that. Um, it ends up when you have a bunch of p-values, you get something that's chi-square distributed. That's easy to work with, right? Every stats package has that. Uh, the problem is comparing the difference of uh, chi-squares is not straightforward. Uh, we had to actually derive this. We couldn't find any paper that did it, so we derived the model ourselves. It ends up it follows a variance gamma distribution with some certain parameters. The details are in the appendix of the paper, but you can actually get, again, a pure statistical test for this, right? which is quite nice. So we can say, just based on a pure statistics approach, one model is indeed better than another. Um, and that's summarized there. You can implement it. Uh, there's actually some ways to implement it in sci-fi, um, so you can just use that. Um, also, Mathematica and Math Lab have it too. Um, yeah, so our other issue is going to be is observability. As I mentioned, we don't know the frauds that happen the year they happen, right? So we're going to have to be very careful when we back test. When, we, when we're doing a back test to figure out, say, using data from 2005 to 2009, in 
2009, we didn't know who committed fraud for the most part. So we actually have to censor our data so that we don't bias our algorithm, right? We actually have to want to train telling it some lies, right? We say, that company didn't have fraud because you didn't know it had fraud. It actually does, right? But because what we need to do right now, right, we want to say, use data from uh, say 2013 to, or 2013 to 2018 to tell us who's committing fraud this year, right? Well, we don't know everyone who had fraud in 2018, and so we want to give it a similar sort of data to what we actually have to work with. Otherwise, it's actually not going to work very well. Um, so our solution is going to be censoring, um, and that'll end up mimicking what we actually need to do today. Uh, the last issue is these infrequent events, right? Um, so fraud, uh, so we have, say, 38,000 uh, firm years, firm years meaning years of data per firm. Out of those, 505 of them have fraud, right? That's a bit over one per, like 1.6%. 1 That's quite low, right? For typical logistic frameworks, we typically want 10%. So we have some issues, right? So we're gonna have to be really careful when it comes to this, especially when we're doing five-year windows. There are some windows where we have maybe 30, 40 frauds, right? That's really tough to, to actually classify. Um, so there's some ways we can do it. The first way would be to just use very simple models. Unfortunately, we already know those do not work at all in fraud detection because these, actually, like, I mean, that's the, the old financial models of the 1990s, they just don't work anymore. The second is to uh, use a degenerate variable identification strategy and sort of find a very strategic way of removing variables. So that's what we're going to mainly do. Um, or you can use some automated methods, right? Use Lasso, use XGBoost. Um, we have Lasso implemented in the paper. XGBoost works great, but it's not implemented in the paper. Uh, as for as far, as far how we do this, um, we start by tossing everything into the model. And then we actually use a QR decomposition. So for you guys who took linear algebra, that actually is quite relevant sometimes. Um, yeah, I know, you don't, you don't think you're going to use it, but actually on occasion it, it comes back, right? So you can use NumPy very easily, just uh, go through that, right? Um, you do a QR decomposition, and using that, you can actually figure out the weights that essentially are assigned to each vector or each feature within your data, right? So the higher the weight on its own feature, the more that variable is independent from the rest. Right? So we're going to call this independentness. Um, and then we're essentially going to just kick out the variables that aren't independent enough so that we can at least get a converging loading. Right? So at the beginning, we may have to kick some out just because we don't even have enough events to, uh, or actually more variables than events, so we'll kick those out. Right? After that, then we're going to do some other stuff. We use a new Grafson solver for the loaded because that one converges a bit better than some other ones. So you have to be very careful with the uh, optimization uh, that you use for the logit, some of them simply will not converge even when the logit is convergent. Then we have to check out something called quasi-completeness. Uh, so it's something you probably haven't heard of, but on occasion, if you run a logit and you get, say, a standard error of a million on a variable between zero and one, that's what quasi-completeness is. So if you have a, when you get results that just look completely ridiculous, that's typically caused by this. Uh, it's a case where the logit converged, but it kind of didn't converge. Um, essentially, it's, it's a case where it is technically convergible in some edge case, but the edge case is so far away from any reasonable model that there's no reason to use it. And so we're going to keep track of that as well. We're going to keep iterating the model and essentially run a simulation to figure out where it converges at, in terms of the number of variables in the model, and then keep that, right? Um, it's awfully, uh, an awfully sophisticated method to actually get at this, uh, but it works quite well. We can get stable coefficients for all of our regressions. We can nice models that work no matter what year it is, no matter how many frauds there were. Um, and so I think this is a pretty good method if you want a true stats method and you don't want to fall back on, say, XGBoost or Lasso to do. Uh, but nothing wrong with using Lasso or XGBoost. Lasso doesn't perform quite as well as that model but in practice. Um, XGBoost probably does. Um, then a few final comments. So this model is actually a bit more flexible than uh, I mentioned in the top, right? So it can predict fraud, right? It can predict other things. So for instance, you can say, these are not only frauds, but frauds where the management admitted that it was a fraud and that's how it was first released, right? We can actually predict the way the fraud will become publicly available in the future. We can also look at just certain types of fraud. So a fraud that's purely financial. There's, they're, just, they're just covering up the accounting numbers and there's nothing else going on in the background, right? It ends up actually financial or horrible to predict that, right? Our model's a piece of that. We can see when the US government will also investigate, right? We can actually predict that back then. Or we can actually even look at cases where the company is not committing fraud. We, right? we can actually even classify it when they're just having an accidental mistake in their accounting statement. So actually, you can use these types of models to predict quite a bit more than just uh, fraud specifically. 
Um, and then a few uh, final notes on ways you could actually do better, right? So one, use a better tokenizer. We did this back in 2014, right, for the actual text processing. Use spacey or something like that. Use noun phrases. You'll get a much better result for your LDA algorithm. And it's perfectly quite easy to implement these things. Um, second, you could use some econometric methods that are better suited for sparsity, i.e. use XGBoost. XGBoost should give you probably about 0.05 increase in your ROC AUC for this model. Uh, you can also try other machine learning algorithms besides LDA. LDA is actually from 2003. It's been a while. There's newer, better things out there. Uh, there's no harm in trying those. Um, yeah. And there's also other things that aren't LDA based that have come out since this model has been around, right? NLP has actually moved a lot in the past five years. And so, while well, this is actually, say, I would say the most robust fraud detection model in accounting today, there are better ones that can be made. Um, but final note, this, this paper and all this work wasn't motivated by actually building a better model in the first place. So there's a reason why we don't implement these things, right? Our reason was actually to show that something like the content of a document matters and then actually helps predict fraud. Right? So that's why we don't actually go to this extent of implementing these other four things here. Right? If you guys are interested in that, you're welcome to, of course, build on our work and implement those things. Um, but for now, we're going to keep it as it is. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, if you want to learn more, the, so the paper is publicly available on uh, SSRN, uh, so you get that free. Uh, the slides here are also publicly available at rmc.link slash dssg, so you can grab a copy of the slides and PDF for our web. Um, yeah, there's also a bunch of other links that I include in the slides, on the details and data and whatnot. Uh, if you guys have any questions, happy to answer.
recommend in one of I think Blaze publications is to uh, take a look at how an algorithm performs in sample and use that to train the hyper. So we're going to use, say, 1995-1999, train a model on that for frauds, but only in sample, and we're going to use, essentially just run LDA models for a crazy amount of topic or hyperparameters, right? And then we're just going to convert to hyperparameters by looping through that. Um, so it's not, not really a proper grid search, but more of the sort of cutting off some part of the grid because computationally it takes quite a while. Uh, the, the full details of that are included in the paper, so if you want to learn more about that, Okay, I have uh, two questions. First question is, uh, uh, how is your, okay, have, uh, have you checked whether your models will be disrupted with a uh, change of housing standards? Uh, so for that, uh, we don't explicitly check that now. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean you, they have a study in those. Yeah, so we have a study that actually helps to. Yeah, yeah. study one just takes care of most of that anyway, actually, right? So if we were, if we were using full 1994 to 2012 to train, right, that would be a huge issue. But because it's like we only use five years at a time, within, I mean, yeah, most of kind of like five years down for a change. The main one is Sarbanes Oxley in like 2004. Uh, mostly what that coincides with is that financials just drop like a rock at that point. They stop being useful. So, second question is actually uh, would there be a uh, problem if the roster decides to do things like buffering, i.e., it buffers a certain uh, keywords such as if all within the norms. Yeah, so they could do that, right? I mean, now the thing is, it's much harder to do that than it is to say, keep your financials within a certain bound, right? So the, 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 there's a reason why the uh, financials stopped working, and that's because it's actually quite easy to keep within bounds. The style variables typically still work about the same as they always have. They just don't work that well in general. So they, they provide some. <laughs> The thing is, for our model, right, it's a sliding measure. Every year, we're going to retrain the LD model. And actually, I didn't show this in the presentation. Uh, I can pull up the graph. Um, <coughs> anyway, uh, I have a graph um, in the paper where we actually show the topics changing over time. Right? Our topics aren't static. Every, so every time we do a new training window, we're changing what that target is. And so as a manager, you'd have to guess, what's the target for next year? when you're trying to do this, right? It's actually very hard. Also, I was like, we've actually had lawyers approach us on this specific question. Uh, there are some lawyers who, unfortunately, are trying to help clients commit fraud. And so they've asked us, how can we get around your measure? And we're like, well, we're not going to tell you. So, <laughs> 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 Hopefully that answers the question. Um, it is said, if you want to take a look at that, it's in the paper, the, the diagram. So currently, who is using these models that you've done up? Uh, so, the US SEC has a similar type of model, the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, so actually, my co-author worked uh, for the US SEC for a while, um, though I'm required to say that these views are not the SEC's views, they are our own views. Uh, <laughs> but the US SEC actually uses a pretty similar type of model for their own uh, detection of fraud nowadays. Um, I seem to come into a, a maze because as an engineer we always talk about cost and effect. In the same school we seldom talk about Samuelson's uh, theory. That's not cost and effect but you know the trend because it is certain change in the environment. For example Donald Trump become president, you know, the whole thing become a mess. You know, those are bigger factors to change the corporate behavior or the corporate profit and losses then this minute the uh, trends over 10 years, over 20 years. So, I'll say for so I'm, I'm last, yes. saying for that when you do AI, for example in here, do you not try to identify cause and effect relations or just <coughs> making, you know, uh, collections of keywords, collections of trends, and predicting what is going to happen. Yeah, so our, our cause and effect isn't on the economic side, right? Our cause and effect is actually more about the manager side, right? That's why I say that our, our theory for this paper is actually coming from psychology, not from economics, right? We're actually, what we're saying is that when a manager, the, the cause is essentially saying that when a manager is committing fraud, right, there is this change in the mindset of how they approach writing something, right? And so we're, that's what we're actually thinking of. And then we use that to then go, we're essentially using reverse causality type story. Right? So we say, because the manager is committing fraud, they're going to change the way they write, they're going to change what they talk about in the document, 
And then we just invert that and say, well, if there's a correlation this way, we can then back out the fraud the other way, right? So it's not, not as direct in this type of study, right? Because we can't directly observe the manager's actions, right? We actually have to, the only thing we can do is read between the lines. I, I totally agree with you, <coughs> it's difficult to uh, model or <coughs> quantify the manager's behavior, but the manager is working within a system. The yeah. system is a macro system. So, so the, the whole thing is, yeah. when it comes to fraud, right, the, we say there's usually three components that actually drive a fraud, right? The system is at best going to affect one of those three components. A big, a big factor is actually going to be within the company in terms of their corporate culture. That we don't have any way, we don't have data, right? We can't model what a company was like in 1999. We simply don't know what that company's corporate culture was back then, right? And so we have sort of this, issue where we just, at, at least at scale, it's hard to quantify these things, right? I, 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 if we had that, right, I'd love to put that in the model. I do not. So. Yeah. Because Warren Buffett has that. Okay. He, will, I bet he will go and talk to the management mm -hmm. before he invests. Yeah, so yeah. maybe so you should yeah, do that. It's the difference at, at scale, right? We have to yeah. do this, this set for 38,000 firms, right? We have to do 38,000 times that we have to invent a time machine to do it back in the 90s, right? That's the problem, right? We, we could do it for a couple, right? But even for, say, even for the, in terms of the usefulness of the model, if you have to actually interact directly with the company, even for a government, that may be too much, right? It's too much for them to interact with all companies in Singapore, for instance, right? If you say, we can flag them, and then you go talk to them. That's where that stuff comes, right? Then they can say, now let's look at the information system of the company, let's look at the controls, let's look at how the people behave, right? We're just doing a first round of flagging, then it's on,